Okay, so we were discussing the structure of the Ephraim cell in the last class, right? So what we saw was that we have a structure which looks something like this. two back to back inverters, so this is just a regular latch. The axis lines which are DL and DL bar, we call them DL and DL bar because nominally we want the outputs of them to be complementary to, be, to each other. Right? And we have two axis transistors. Now these are connected to the same line which is the word line. Okay. So how does this work? I'll just label all the processes M1, M2, M3, M4, M5 and M6. Okay. How does reading and writing work in the case of the SRAM and what are the constraints that we need to consider while we are designing an SRAM. Okay, that's what we are going to look at now. So the first thing is, as far as reading is concerned, the first step is to pre-charge both decline and decline bar high. The alternative to free charging is to use a pull up. Right? In general, you should always keep that in mind. Free charging means I am specifically using a clock and saying during the time that that clock is 0 or 1, one of those conditions, the bit line and bit line bar or, or whichever line I am trying to pull up is going to get pulled up to a known value. Okay? And during the evaluation phase, that pull up path is deactivated. If I do not deactivate the pull-up path, then it remains a continuous pull-up, which is the case in the pseudo NMOS kind of structure. Right? So in pseudo NMOS, for example, the pull-up is always active. Right? And I need to make sure that my pull-down network is strong enough to be able to pull the output down. In the case of pre-charge evaluate, I am making the job of the pull-down network a little bit easier by saying, during the evaluation phase, I will explicitly turn off the pull-up. So that the pull down network just has an easier job, it has to make sure that it discharges whatever stored charge was there. Okay. So conceptually they are both doing the same thing. In one case you have a problem that the pull down network has to be made stronger so that it can pull down more than what the pull up network is pulling. In the other case you need to make sure that you have these two phases of the clock, the pre-charge and evaluate phase. Okay. Both could be used and either one of them could be used over here. Okay. So for now I am just going to say pre-charge and evaluate. But remember that in general it could be a, just a pull up as well. Okay, depending on the size of the memory, the type of memory that you are trying to design and so on. So anyway, right now what I am saying is I pre-charge decline and decline bar high. Activate WL. And what will happen is M5 and M6 will turn on. Okay. I will call the value at this point Q and this Q bar. Okay. So let's say if Q is 0, Then which transistors come into the picture? M5 and M1. Right? So let's just draw that part of the circuit again separately. We have a bit line. We have access transistor M5. 
and we have this point Q is at zero. How will it be at zero? Only if M1 was on. Right? So for Q to be zero, M1 must have been on. That is that transistor M1 must have been on, M2 off, so that that particular, the left hand side inverter was having a zero at the output. Okay? So this is the present state. DL is precharged high. Q is equal to zero. M1 initially on. Okay. Now, what is going to happen as a result of this? What can happen to the various voltages that you have that are drawn only in this part of the picture? No? DL will start decreasing, right? DL will discharge through M5 and M1. What will happen to the voltage at Q? Will it change at all? No? Yeah, but M1 is still on. So, Q is not going to rise to VDT minus VTS. M1 is still on. M1 is pulling it down. M5 is pulling it up. Okay? So, now M5 and M1 are fighting for the voltage at Q. Okay? Both are on. Which means that the voltage at Q, one thing you can say for sure is it's not going to remain at zero. It's going to go up. But hopefully it won't go up by too much. Why? Why do you not want it to go up? Because you are trying to read from the cell. You don't want to change the content of the cell. Okay? While reading, you don't want the content of the cell to change. Otherwise, that becomes destructive. Just the operation of reading itself can cause the value that is written over there to change. That means that you are doing something wrong. Okay? So, instead what you want to do is that Q, the delta V at Q, must be very small. Okay? How small? Actually speaking, we need not worry about it being very small. You need not say it has to be millivolts or anything of that sort. Right? As long as it does not rise high enough to make the other inverter switch, we are probably safe. Okay, so there is some amount of design margin that you have over here. You can allow the voltage at Q to go up by some amount. Okay? It's just that you don't want it to go up all the way to VDD by 2 or some large value like that. Okay? So then comes the question, because of that, one thing we can be sure of is the voltage at DL is going to start decreasing. But it will take time to decrease. Why will it take time to decrease? Because the capacitance on DL is going to be very large. Why is the capacitance on DL large? Because DL is connected to many such access transistors. And the grain diffusion capacitance of each and every one of those access transistors is attached to there. Even though the transistor itself may be in the off condition, that capacitance is still there. Okay? So because of that, and also apart from that, the BL line itself has its capacitance because of the fact that it's a long conducting wire. Okay? So the next combination is that there is a fairly large capacitance associated with BL, which means that BL will take a long time to decrease. Even though you have turned off the pre-charge and there is nothing trying to pull it up, it will still take a long time by comparison with how much time it takes for an inverter to switch. Okay? The Q, the voltage changing at Q will be much faster than that. So that's why you have to be careful. You have to make sure that before DL 
or rather during the time that dl takes to discharge the voltage that q should not rise up to such a point that it can flip the other inverter okay now it's not easy to flip the other inverter because after all as far as the other inverter is concerned it is still seeing a zero at its input and hence showing a one at its output okay and not only is there one at its output through the access transistor it is also connected to a one on the dl bar okay so the other inverter will not switch very easily but you still have to be careful about how you design this because otherwise you can get it to a point where some additional noise anything in the system can affect the value that is stored over there okay so because of that one thing that we are clear about is when q is and we don't want the delta v at q to become very large so basically when q becomes zero and assume q is zero dl will decrease q will increase right so this delta v at q must be small now how is that what is it that determines the value of delta v huh somebody say something loudly and clearly the ratio of what m5 to m1 right ratio meaning what in this case we have to take the w5 by l5 and w1 by l1 both because it is possible that i might choose to put a transistor which is not of minimum length right unlike the case where i am designing logic circuits there i'll always choose minimum length for the transistor and modify only the w over here there may be a situation where i might find that you know even minimum w is not sufficient i have to actually make l longer in order to reduce the w by l okay so just for clarity what we say is w5 by l5 what does that indicate w5 by l5 if that value is large then it is going to result in a small resistance for m5 okay equal and i am just sort of giving the intuitive explanation over here if w5 by l5 is large the equivalent on resistance of m5 is going to be small okay if w1 by l1 is large then the equivalent resistance of m1 is going to be small okay this ratio we'll call cr the cell ratio or sometimes also called cr on the cell read ratio okay so what is the cell read ratio what should it be should it be large or should it be small it should be you don't want delta v to be large right which means that i don't want a large value of i don't want the resistance of m5 to be very small if the resistance of m5 is small compared to m1 then all the delta v effectively you know will be large because the r1 by r1 plus r2 that ratio right it is going to raise the voltage at q significantly so c r should be small so that delta v is not large capacitance at point q okay so what happens to the capacitance at point q 
it does come into the picture, but on the other hand, we are talking about a relatively long time scale, right? We are talking about a time scale where that it takes for BL to get pulled down. Okay. During the entire time that BL is getting pulled down, by the time that BL gets pulled down, whatever is the rising or falling due to any capacitance, the dynamic nature of the capacitance at, at due to a single transistor, will have a much smaller time constant. Okay? So this is almost like a static condition that we are considering. BL getting pulled down takes a long time. Which means that the BL is going to remain at VDD for a significantly long time. During that time, we don't want the delta V at Q to rise up. Okay? So you are right, the capacitance at Q will play some role, but we are talking about a slightly longer time scale over there. Okay? The capacitance at Q is going to be very tiny compared to the capacitance on the big line. So the time constant associated with it is also going to be much smaller. Right? So because of that, what we want is the cell ratio W5 by L5 divided by W1 by L1. That should be small so that the equivalent resistance of M5 is not very small compared to that of M1. If it was very small, then the delta V would have been large. Okay? And in the process of reading, we would have resulted in a situation where it's possible it's possible, not guaranteed, that the data stored inside the cell could be changed. Okay? So see how this cell ratio has to be kept small, small enough. Okay? That word small enough is the tricky part. That's where design comes into the picture. Right? As a designer, what you need to do is, you are not given, you can't just solve any equations and say, okay, this will be the value of CR. What you need to do is you have to basically simulate or try out different values of CR and say okay this much margin is going to be available if I choose this value of CR. This is sufficient for me, I will take this as my design parameter. Okay? That's one of the most important things you need to keep in mind as far as design is concerned. This applies even for the course projects that you are going to be working on now. Hopefully all of you saw the description of the course project. Within about a day or so, we will also be putting up a sample inverter, okay, which gives you sort of the sizes that need to be followed for the cell. But that's it, that's the only constraint that I am going to get. The cell should fit within this vertical constraint. Okay. Beyond that, the individual sizes of the transistor, how wide they are, how they are connected, all those things are left up to you. Okay. And you can basically choose different values for that and get different values for the driving capacitance, the driving current, the delay. Okay. So design in general becomes a question of saying, okay, these are, I have a number of different choices. Any one of them will work. Some of them will work better than others. So at some point I need to justify why I am choosing one of them and go with that. Somebody else might make another choice and be able to justify it equally well. Okay? Same thing applies for the case of SRAM cell design. There is no unique answer to what should be the cell ratio. You can't just solve an equation and get that number from it. You can sort of put a constraint saying, look, the cell ratio must be less than this value. Otherwise, the delta V will become greater than, let's say, the threshold voltage of the next case. That much you can solve by an equation. But is threshold voltage or the next stage the problem or is midpoint voltage or the next stage the problem or is something else the constraint that you need to satisfy? That depends partly on experience and it's the design decision that you have to take. Okay? The important point is we need to understand which way the cell ratio will influence. Okay. Alright, so that's as far as reading is concerned. Right? Now what happens in the case of writing? How do I write new data into the cell? Okay. Once again what I have over here is I have presently got the situation where Q is equal to 0, Q bar is equal to 1. Let's say I want to change that. I want to make Q equal to 1, Q bar equal to 0.
what are the steps that we will follow over here? Now, instead of pre-charging decline and decline bar both to 1, I will set the value of decline to 1 and set BL bar equal to 0, then activate WS. Okay? Q is 0 initially, bit line is equal to 1. What should happen? The value at Q should rise. Right? So that I am writing a 1 into the set. What's the problem? Can you see any problem over here itself without looking at the rest of the data? How did I choose the sizes of N5 and N1? Huh? I chose N5 and N1 so that the delta V at Q is small. Right? So effectively I have made it difficult to write. Okay? So just this part of it if I consider and say that you know by having the choice of these two transistors that is sufficient for it to write, then I have a problem. Because in order to read successfully without damaging the contents of the cell, I chose the M5 and M1 sizes such that the delta V at Q is going to be small. Okay. Once I have made that choice, it essentially means that I cannot write into the cell by means of this. Luckily, I have the other bit line bar. What is connected to that? M6 and so bit line bar is equal to 0. Okay. Currently the value of Q bar is 1 initially. Why is it 1? Because this transistor over here, M4, is on. Okay? So now I have another contest between two transistors, M4 and M6. M4 is trying to pull Q bar up to 1, M6 is trying to pull Q bar down to 0. Okay? Luckily in this case, it is not again the access transistor and the NMOS, in this case it is access transistor and the CMOS. So I have some more flexibility over there. I can choose the sizes once again of the PMOS appropriately. Right? How do I do that? I define something called the pull-up ratio over here. Just like PR, I now have a PR. This is equal to W4 by L4 divided by W6 by L6. Okay? And in this case, it should be chosen such that the value at Q bar will change. So for that what do I need to do? The resistance of M4 must be significant compared to the resistance of M6. Okay? So a smaller value of M4, that is W4 by L4, is good for me. 
right? A smaller value of W4 by L4 will essentially mean that the delta V at Q bar will be significant, okay? And effectively, once the delta V at Q bar becomes significant, what does that do? The positive feedback in the lab starts kicking in. The moment I have a drop in the value at Q bar, the left hand side inverter is no longer strongly driven. Right? It can flip more easily. So, whatever is the delta V at Q, that might be enough to flip that inverter. Okay? And the positive feedback then kicks in. Q becomes equal to 1, Q bar becomes equal to 0. Okay? So, this pull up ratio should be small. Right? So, effectively what we have over here is, in the case of designing an SRAM cell, what we need to do over here is make sure that the sizes of the different transistors are chosen in such a way that reading can happen successfully without disturbing the contents of the cell and writing can also happen even though the reading transistors were chosen such that the cell contents do not get disturbed. Right? So, these give you two different constraints on the size of transistors. Luckily, they are not opposing constraints, which means that you can satisfy both of them and get a proper SRAM cell design. Okay? Now, there are a few other things that we can do over here. This structure that we saw is called the 6T SRAM cell. Four, in, uh, four transistors in the inverter and two access transistors. Right? One thing that we can see over here is I can choose my as far as choosing the sizes of the NMOS and TMOS are concerned I should choose it such that the cell ratio and the pull-up ratio conditions are satisfied. I don't care too much about the switching threshold of the inverter. So, the switching threshold can be skewed considerably in some direction. Not close to VDD by 2. Right? Because in any case, what is being done is I am storing some contents in the lab. I am reading from it using the bit line and access and all those conditions. And then later I am also writing into it using the same kind of structure. Okay. So, as long as I have something of that sort, I don't need to worry too much about the switching threshold as such. Okay. The other thing that can be done is, I can go for something called a 4 T S RAM cell. Which two transistors do you think you will replace? If you were given the choice, which transistors would you replace for this? Supposing I say you have to reduce from 6 transistors to 4 transistors. Huh? The access transistors cannot be touched because you need to have some mechanism by which the cell itself is connected to your bit line. Okay? So now it becomes a question of instead of having an inverter with CMOS and NMOS, can I have a different kind of inverter which uses only one transistor? How else would you do it if you have only one in, uh, if you have only one transistor? Use a register as the load for the transistor. Now the interesting thing is unlike the case where we wanted a good value of DOL, I can choose a large value of R and 
and let D O L be high. Right? Why is it that I can let D O L be high? Because I know that I am only using this inverter in the form of this back to back lag. Back to back inverter pair which is used as a lag. I am not using it any, under any other condition. And that lag in turn has to only drive the bit lines by a small amount. After that the sense amplifier takes over. Okay. So under those conditions what I can say is the VOL can be chosen to be high which means that the resistance itself can be chosen fairly large which means that even something like the static power dissipation will be quite low. Right? Because the on current under the condition that the input is equal to 1 will be quite small because the R is chosen to be large. So once I have something of that sort, I can make this a relatively, it is possible by using some special kind of processing technique to make very compact large resistors. Okay. And by doing that you can make this entire cell probably even slightly more compact than in the case of the PMOS transistor. Okay. So instead of using a PMOS transistor, you can make something which is more effective in terms of size. Okay? And have a four transistor as one cell. As such, otherwise you are not gaining anything. If, if it turns out that the area occupied by the resistor is greater than that occupied by the transistor, then you gain nothing. Okay? Except maybe for some little bit wiring. But in this case, it turns out that there are ways of making fairly large resistances in a compact manner. Okay. And this kind of structure is used. Okay. All right. Now, there's one additional thing which comes into the picture when you are talking about SRAN. There is a concept of something called the static noise margin. Okay. And the way that this is defined, more or less. It is actually defined as the largest delta V at one of the inverters which will cause the state of the pair of inverters to flip. Okay. So what we have if we draw the load characteristic, we have one inverter and the other inverter characteristic is like this. Okay. Now intuitively you can probably notice that this gap over here, I want this gap to be as large as possible, right? A larger value for this gap essentially tells me that I have good inverters, they are working well and that the chance of some small amount of noise slipping from one side to the other is less, right? So for example, instead if I have something which looks like this. Let's say that VOL is not equal to 0, it is some fairly large quantity. Right? And the other one therefore goes something like this. Intuitively I can see that the one on the right has a much smaller noise margin than the one on the left. Right? The two transistor characters, the two inverter characteristics are much closer to each other. It's switching from one inverter to the other, right, causing it to flip, can be achieved by having a much smaller delta V. Okay? In this case, what is done is the static noise margin is defined in terms of this. I try and take the largest possible square that can be fit within this characteristic. This is called the butterfly characteristic. Why butterfly? Because it looks roughly shaped like a butterfly. Okay. What I do is I take
the largest possible square that can be made to fit within this. And call the length of the square, of the side of the square, the static noise mark. In this case, it is much smaller. Okay? So, what is it? I take the difference, the butterfly characteristic, that is the difference between the two inverter characteristics when they are super, uh, superimposed one on top of the other. And within that, graphically, I try and fit a square. Okay? The square has to have its size parallel to the x and y axis. Okay, that's the only condition. Under that condition, I try and get the largest possible such square. Okay? And once I have that set up like that, I take the side of that square. And that V, the amount of voltage that corresponds to, is called the static noise mark. So there is some theory behind this. Essentially the thing comes out to, under what conditions can you get the maximum possible difference between the two curves. Okay? But this is more of an intuitive justification that I am giving right now. It says that once you are able to fit a square into this area, the size of the square essentially gives you the static noise margin. Okay? And the larger that square, the better the noise margin is that you have. Okay? Alright, so that takes us to the end of s -run. Okay? What remains now is some mostly qualitative, there is not much that I can do quantitatively, it is a description of how DRAMs are constructed, right? So, dynamic RAM as you might imagine is dynamic in nature which means that there is some kind of a storage of charge on a capacitance somewhere which is responsible for actually holding the value of the memory cell, okay? So, it is some kind of a dynamic latch which is being used, but it is not one of the regular dynamic latches that we are already familiar with. Usually what is done is that there are two different structures that are used in order to store data in a dynamic RAM cell, okay? One of them is called the 3 T cell, the 3 transistor dynamic RAM cell, okay? Its structure looks something like this. There is a capacitance, an implicit capacitance. I am putting a dotted line because there may not be a separate physical capacitance that you draw over there. We might just use the gate capacitance of the transistor. Right? There is DL1 over here. DL2 over here. And what I am going to do is, I have two access transistors once again as before. But I am not, I am explicitly not writing it as DL and DL bar. I am keeping it separate. I am calling it DL1 and DL2. Right? And what I am saying is, when I want to read the contents of this cell, I will activate one word line over here, which I will call RWL, the read word line. Okay? How does this work? Let's say that, now this point over here is a floating node. Why do I call it a floating node? Because when the left hand side access transistor is off, there is no path connecting that particular node to either VDD or to ground. So whatever capacitor, whatever charge was there on the capacitance will remain over there. 
If it was charged up to VDD, it should hopefully remain at VDD. If it was discharged to ground, then it should remain at ground. Okay? Now what will happen when I activate RWL? Let's say that the voltage at X was equal to zero, right? That means that there is no conducting path through M2 and M3, right? Because M2 is off. X is zero, M2 is off. There is no path from BL2 to ground. So BL2 remains high. Okay? But let's say that X was equal to 1. Then what happens is, M2 and M3 are both on. BL2 will discharge. Right? So effectively BL2 will get the opposite of whatever was stored at X. It will act like an inverting ring. Okay. Now how do I write into this step? I use the other bit left. Okay. I make BL1 to be either 0 or 1 and activate M1. Okay. WWL the right word line. Okay. Once I activate the right word line, what will happen is if DL1 was equal to 1, then X will charge up to VD. If DL1 is equal to 0, X will discharge. Okay? Now, of course, I still have this problem that when DL1 is equal to 1, X may not charge all the way up to VGD, it would go up to VGD minus VT because it's a fast transistor also. But that doesn't really matter. All that I care about is X should go somewhere above the threshold voltage of M2. Okay. The discharge on the other hand is taken care of properly. X will go all the way down to zero and turn off the M2. Okay. So both of those conditions are satisfied. The three transistor SRAM, the DRAM cell, it has a dynamic node which actually takes care of storing the data. Okay, and the data can then be read and written using different bit lines and word lines. Okay, all right. We we'll stop here for now. There are only one or two small topics remaining as far as SRAM and as far as memory are concerned. After which there are one or two other topics, and then we'll be looking also at a little bit of HDLs and higher level design concerns later. In the day.